and welcome back. Thank you very much for staying with us. It's time for our Sunday live interview. And as I mentioned earlier, we're discussing the uh, likely scenarios in the Ruto no case to answer motion. Uh, ICC judges will be ruling on that this Tuesday. Let me introduce my panel to you. To my right is advocate Charles Kanjama. And on my left, political analyst Javas Bigambo. Um, I'll begin with you, Charles. So, you, what is the likelihood that the court, given both the legal and political implications, would enter a no case to answer verdict? I think uh, what you've seen is that uh, all the commentators who have been closely involved in the case have taken a very cagey stance. Uh, none of them wants to commit uh, themselves one way or the other. I think uh, the Kenyans who have been involved in the case as part of the defense are really hopeful that uh, there will be a verdict of no case to answer. But they are leaving open the door of possibility uh, because uh, the standard of proof in a no case to answer motion is actually rather low. So that even though they are confident that the evidence has not reached the threshold, uh, because the standard is so low, it is possible uh, for the judges to conclude that that low threshold has been surmounted and to put uh, uh, Ruto and uh, Sang on their defense. So I think right now I would say it's a 50-50 kind of situation, although uh, there is general anticipation of a positive outcome by the defense team. And what would you say are the judge's biggest considerations in determining whether there should be a case to answer or not in this case? Okay, of course they determine the legal or technical term is whether there is a prima facie case. In other words, whether on the basis of the evidence that has been presented by the prosecution, there is any possibility of eventually obtaining a conviction. Assuming the defense was not to present any evidence, there is evidence of the prosecution strong enough to make them think twice about whether uh, to put uh, the defense on their defense. Uh, one of the key issues, of course, is that the judges will not want to waste time if the case is already hopeless. Uh, they'll also be considering the fact that uh, six key witnesses of the prosecution were kicked out uh, on by the appeals chamber because they had not presented uh, evidence that uh, either they presented affidavit evidence and did not come on oath or so on. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the evidence was, had been recanted and so it was thrown out. Uh, they'll also be considering, I guess, the political situation. Uh, we like saying as lawyers that judges should not uh, consider politics in making their decisions because law is different from politics and right and wrong should not depend on politics. Mm -hmm. This is what we call the political question doctrine. Actually, political questions are not justiciable. You can't take them to court. But you also say that judges tend to be aware of the political context, uh, the historical context, the socio-political context in which they are making their decisions. And it seems that uh, the people they were trying to help, the International Criminal Court, no longer seem interested in the assistance uh, that they were providing by going after what they considered the high-level perpetrators of the post-election violence in Kenya. Mm -hmm. Jabez, because it's talked in the politics, let's delve right into it. it. There's either a case to answer or no case to answer. Either way, what are the political implications? Well, of course, the political pot is cooking. And whichever way the ruling goes on Tuesday, uh, there is so much that will come out of it. The steam that will come out of it will either fuel uh, the politics are in, the, in a very quiet direction. Of course, it will give so much political impetus to the deputy president if at all uh, you know, the ruling is in his favor and occurs to answer motion. And you may recall that uh, uh, the deputy president joining our president Kenyatta rode into office on the horse you know, fighting the ICC mm -hmm. and uh, the various nemesis opponents that had been termed as detractors who possibly had been thought to have, uh, you know, necessitated their being taken to the uh, ICC. And the other thing is that there will be also various undertones that will come out of this. Remember there are victims here. Remember that in the vast Rift Valley, there is still so much tension there. So in case uh, the, 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 the case is, throw out, is thrown out, there are those who would feel that 
the victims of course, their relations, and even keen observers and neighbors and friends, that uh, this whole thing was a fiasco, and that justice in the end will not be meted in the interest of the victims. And that also will have an implication moving forward. And looking at it, you know, through that, uh, you know, prism, you realize that um, the state of our politics is still volatile. And one, of course, it's hinged on uh, the ICC issue because it is fueling. Right now it has been fueling, it will continue fueling our politics. And in the end, if at all uh, the matter is not thrown out, then again, of course, it will be a millstone round the neck of the deputy president. And it will have, uh, you know, to create some strains between uh, the URP wing in the Jubilee Coalition and the TNA wing. Of course, all is not rosy. I get that those who also predict that, that the opposite situation would still have the same result. That even if, uh, you know, there is no case to answer, mm -hmm. that still it would bring problems in the coalition. Well, of course, factually speaking, you appreciate that uh, the president and the deputy president rode into office on the platform of, uh, you know, the ICC issue. And that is the only thing that seemed to bring them together, the umbilical cord that was feeding them. In the absence of the ICC matter, uh, of course, each would want to uh, chart a different political course, appreciating too that because of the uh, fr you know, friction that has been there between the members of the coalition you know, partners, at the top, of course, the deputy president and the president uh, have demonstrated that they are seamless, that they are friends, but their foot soldiers are pulling in different directions. And whichever way this ruling goes, of course, remember too that uh, the deputy president and his handlers have imagined publicly that it is some of the handlers of uh, the president, mm. you know, who orchestrated, who supported, in fact, who uh, voiced against the deputy president, uh, you know, in respect to the issues of witnessing at the ICC. So either way, whichever way this matter goes on the 5th, it has got huge political implications and it will have a bearing on how the politics start taking a different direction. For 2017. If, if the court was to decide that there is a case to answer, do you imagine having the prosecutor already say, you know, that because of uh, the dismissal of recanted evidence that she has a weak case going forward, that this is an issue that would likely stay before the courts into 2017? Uh, in the event uh, the court was to say that there is a case to answer, then uh, the responsibility moves to the defense uh, teams of uh, William Ruto and Joshua Rapsang to present their evidence. The only job the prosecutor would have then is to cross-examine the witnesses presented by the defense teams. Uh, however, considering how long the case has taken of mm -hmm. the prosecution, mm -hmm. it is actually quite conceivable and indeed likely that if there was a case to answer, uh, that case would take uh, more than nine months and indeed would go into 2017. And then into 2022? No, no, not into 2022. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> That's a bit too long. <laughs> <laughs> That's too long. At most it would take maybe a year and a half, probably two years, at mm -hmm. the very uh, most. If, if the case was to proceed, despite the fact, um, again, as I've mentioned, uh, about you know, the prosecutor's already uh, admission of weak evidence, d does it seem to cast a shadow of doubt in terms of the court's credibility, in terms of the high threshold? You know, when, when this case is also talked about it having to reach su a, such a high threshold of evidence for it even to be before the ICC, would it put a question mark on the credibility of the court? Definitely to Anne. I think uh, when these cases started at the ICC, the Kenyan case, uh, the prosecutor at the time, uh, Luis Moreno Campo, actually said that the Kenyan case was going to be a demonstration to the world about how ICC does its, its justice. And I have argued on a number of occasions that not only the Kenyans who are put on trial were on trial at the ICC, uh, because of the statements of people like Luis Moreno Campo, because of the way in which the politics and the circumstances around the Kenyan case developed, the ICC itself became on trial. In other words, the world mm -hmm. was looking, Africa was looking, Kenya was looking and saying, what is your standard of justice? What do you have to teach us about how to carry out our criminal prosecutions? Mm -hmm. So definitely if the ICC was to fail, the 
basic tests of uh, constitutional democracies of ensuring that there's a right to fair hearing, that uh, the, the standard of proof is beyond reasonable doubt, it would raise uh, very serious questions. And I think those have already been raised in Africa. Uh, I hope uh, the ICC will not be making its decision uh, thinking about expediency of uh, the reputation of the court, but thinking about the actual justice in those mm -hmm. two cases that are before it. But definitely whatever outcome comes out from the ICC will have repercussions both for Kenya and for the court. At, at various stages of, of these proceedings, you know, um, those allied to the deputy president have, have threatened at one point or another non-cooperation with the court. And many times they have said, you know what, we're, we're just going to stop collaborating. Uh, what, how do you think this has affected the cases uh, so far? And how does that affect politics as well. It is clear to all of us that the judges have also been very keen on the politics playing in the country. And that's why you remember on occasions when the deputy president and his allies have taken to the Agora and uh, you know, taken swipes at the court, the court has come out to warn them against making such statements that uh, could you know, uh, have some political implication or whipping up emotions of the people. Mm -hmm. And we know pretty well that um, in the end uh, this whole thing has uh, a very strong political dimension. Factually, is that uh, the ICC matter has so much dismembered uh, Kenya. People have taken, have been taken into quarters, you know, various political quarters, and still, the, you know, whichever way the ruling goes, we will remain dismembered until we start a national conversation mm. about how we want to remember ourselves. Uh, after all these uh, ICC issues because too many people have got too many pains and all that families fractured for uh, property lost etc and appreciate too that because of uh, all this uh, if they are acquitted the question that will be ringling will be who then were behind <coughs> sorry who are then were behind the post election violence of 2007-2006 do you see at all the, the possibility of a local solution still coming up and trying to answer that question here. There has been a lack of political willingness mm. to try and create a local, uh, you know, mechanism that could try to put this matter into, you know, to test this matter. For instance, we have got after the 2010 constitution in place, the Chief Justice of Kenya, uh, Dr. William Mutunga, is best placed, for example, to come up or to create a division you know within the judicial system that can now interrogate can try these matters but so far we have not seen that there has been an effort on the part of the judiciary to try and test all these issues appreciating that ICC is a court a complementary court mm -hmm. we have not seen an effort at the local level to try and uh, you know take you know, people to face and the so law. So you doubt there would be one going there forward? There will not be none going forward. All right. And politically too, there is no willingness mm. to have this matter settled here. As we wind up, you've said that the ICC issue has dismembered Kenya. Is there any way in which Kenya, whichever way these cases go, in, in which Kenya has been better off because we invited the ICC? Uh, let me start by saying, as I answer your question, that actually uh, there have been a number of attempts uh, to seek justice for the victims locally. None of them has worked. The most high profile was the interagency uh, team that was set up involving the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, the police, the CID, and they came together, uh, the Office of the Attorney General, they came together and reviewed over 300 uh, cases or complaints that had been made. Unfortunately, there wasn't sufficient evidence. And I clearly agree that uh, one of the challenges we faced is lack of political will. Mm. But this lack of political will started in 2008, at the time when we could have collected the evidence mm. of the cases of um, post-election violence and so on. So that when you come now, even if you have political will today, There's how do you collect the, the evidence? evidence? It's right. already disappeared. It's eroded. Uh, has Kenya become better because of the ICC process? Mm. I would say our national um, discourse has, sudden, has certainly been enriched in terms of our awareness that uh, the actions of our politicians at the local level can have very high repercussions. 
that uh, Kenya cannot be an isolated uh, state in the region or in the world and that uh, the security of the country is a matter of concern even beyond the country that the international community has a stake in the country although and to be honest uh, uh, considering the current uh, level of polarization ethnic polarization the beginning of, of um, violent drums being beaten uh, already one year before the next general elections I don't know whether the lessons we have learned from ICC coming into Kenya are that deep. Uh, they seem to have mm. been uh, very aggressive, but at the end of the day, we are, we are forgetting the lessons pretty fast. So I, right. I'm a bit uh, skeptical about whether there are any lasting lessons from the ICC experience beyond the fact mm. uh, that I think future Kenyan leaders will try their utmost to avoid referring cases to international <laughs> tribunals. Wow. Your final thoughts, very briefly, if you would. Well, uh, of course, we have seen that, uh, for instance, uh, there is the PBO Act in place. We have seen that uh, Major General Ali, who had previously been accused, is now in charge of uh, the uh, NGOs board. Uh -huh. And all these questions are tied to the issues of the post-election violence. Moving forward, I think we need to have a country that is willing to start honest conversations on how we can get to a point where we want to start healing and we want to see how our politics can advance the course of not only justice, but a nation that is united for progress. I thank you both for your views.